what are your thoughts on on these um, so called uh, health benefits of, of foods high in, in flavonoids? Yeah, well, I mean that, that's a that's another good good example of of the of the way ways that, that plants can defend themselves of not just being directly toxic or poisonous and just dropping you dead like bryson. They can do other things. They can increase inflammation. They can cause you stress and pain and, and soreness. This is why you, you, you probably noticed yourself that you know, you're working out on a carnivore diet, like you don't get sore like you used to. And But maybe if you drink a cup of coffee or something slips in, or a bit of rice slips into your meal, I, I'm, I'm sore for days afterwards. And it's, it's miserable. And I don't like that, even though I was sore basically every day of my life for decades, You know, playing sports as a kid and, and uh, half, half and half as an adult. And so, you know, these are just, these are just some of those. And, and, and there are many, many examples of these endocrine disruptors and isoflavonoids that, that, that disrupt your body's normal functioning. Uh, soy is a great example of that. There's a number of, well, it's just an abundance of, um, of phytoestrogens that, that mimic the, the action of estrogen in our body. And this just disrupts your hormonal functioning. And so you start eating something it will mess up your hormonal functioning. Maybe you can't reproduce. You're not going to make kids that are going to eat that plant. If you have a particular interest in that plant, that helps that plant, you know, make it so that you're not going to be successful and breed and, and, and uh, be as successful as other animals that maybe you're eating something else. Um, there's another ones with, uh, you know, we talked about, about, uh, um, anti-nutrients. That's, that's another way that they want to stop you from being as successful from eating them and get less out of that by it makes it yeah. themselves less nutritious or, or other things less nutritious. Like there's, there's protease inhibitors in wheat and soy that block your enzymes from breaking down even completely bioavailable proteins, such as, you know, that you find in meat. So you're eating pasta with meatballs, well, you're actually not going to be able to absorb or, or even break down and absorb the protein from those meatballs as well as you would have been because of the, the wheat that you ate with. Soy in particular is pretty bad. This is something that, again, that's uh, given a bad rap to meat. I actually spoke, I've spoken to many people about this and well, I can't eat meat because it you know, has so many hormones and you have all these hormones that they're, they're injecting in these animals. And uh, yeah, it's true. They, they do in, in inject growth hormones and, and things like that into animals to help them grow. Not all of them, but some do. And so they're worried about that. They say, oh my gosh, it's just, it's just it's like eating steroids. Go, well, first of all, if they were, then, then a lot of bodybuilders would be all over that. And that's probably not, you know, uh, that's not really going to be um, uh, something that you see. Um, but when you actually look at the numbers, you know, they say that, well, when you have a hormone treated cow, say, it's, it has twice the amount of estrogen in it as normal. I'm like, oh my God, double the amount of hormones. That's insane. Well, put that in context because it's two nanograms of, of estrogen in three ounces of lean, untreated beef. And then 3.9 nanograms in three ounces of hormone treated beef. Okay, so that's that's technically almost double, right? So it's technically correct. The problem is that they don't tell you the rest of the story because I've had patients who have said to me, well, my oncologist, they have like breast cancer or something like that. And like my oncologist said, I cannot eat meat, especially red meat, because it has so much estrogen in it. And so that's that, you know, my my cancer is estrogen sensitive. So the problem is that, and then what do they eat? They're eating plant-based. Maybe they're eating a lot of soy because they know protein and soy and all of a sudden so good for you. It's a superfood. So 3.9 nanograms for three ounces of, of lean treated beef. The birth control pill has 35,000 nanograms of estrogen. A fertile woman makes upwards of 150,000 nanograms a day. And three ounces of soy, which many of these people are replacing that beef with have over a million nanograms of these phytoestrogens, right? Now they, they may not bind exactly as, as well as our, our, you know, natural estrogens, but they're still doing a hell of a lot more than we want them to. And a hell of a lot more than, you know, even the birth control pill in some cases, and certainly a hell of a lot more than, than beef. So, you know, this is just, again, just you know, just, uh, it's just misinformation. And this is how statistics can be used 
in, in uh, very, very misleading ways. This is why the, the saying goes, there are three kinds of lies. There are lies, there are damn lies, and there are statistics. And so these are those statistics. Oh, there's twice as much estrogen in, uh, in beef. Yes, that's technically correct. There's twice as much estrogen in hormone-treated beef as unhormone-treated unhorm beef, but that's not the whole picture. You need to know the whole story. The devil's in the details. Um, there's a number of other things. There's things that are called goitrogens, which are uh, different chemicals that can disrupt the normal uh, functioning of our thyroid, like you, like you say, but now our brain says, okay, we need more of this stuff. We're not seeing enough. So you start producing a lot more TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, which is triggering your thyroid to, to make more, make more, make more, and actually is growing. So it's a, it's a gland, just like a muscle, you get more signal to grow, it's going to grow. And so it does, but it's not able to make uh, thyroid hormone properly for there's many things in, in, in different ways that they disrupt it. But and even just not having enough iodine can do that can, you know, because you're, you don't have enough iodine to complete the process and make uh, this thyroid hormone. And so you've got all this almost thyroid hormone just waiting there for this bottleneck uh, of, um, of iodine. And so it grows and grows and grows. Uh, there are a number of these things in uh, kale as well. And so even to the point that, I mean, they originally tried to feed kale to cows and they just hated it. And so they, they couldn't really pass this off on them. Uh, but in, in dairy cows that they were, they were giving uh, kale to, that the milk actually was causing goiters in kids and, and giving thyroid deficiencies from the milk. So this is something that cow is not designed to eat either. And so it's not able to detoxify and, and clear this stuff properly. And so that's getting into the milk and that's getting into you. And now you're getting thyroid disruption because of that. Um, you know, you talk about you know, the, the, the fact that they, they absolutely increase this inflammatory reaction and they call that good. Okay, well, which one is it? Is it, is it anti-inflammatory or is it pro-inflammatory and inflammation is good now? You know, that doesn't make any sense. You know, so they're, they're talking about this increase in, in the production of your, of your immune cytokines that's making things more inflamed. That's, that's, that's disrupting the normal working of your inflammatory system and, and the normal workings of your immune system and causing it to overreact to a situation. You're not, you're not supposed to be, you know, uh, stimulating these things. Your body is supposed to decide when, when and where that happens. If it doesn't do that, you get significant problems. You can get a lot of pain. You can get soreness. You can get your body attacking itself like autoimmune issues. So it's very important to leave your body alone and just let it get on with it, with its with its uh, normal functioning. It's it's um, very very likely that what we have been des you know designed to eat, what we've been eating for millions of years, is what we should continue eating. Right? There's no hard evidence of any animal anywhere on Earth that is optimized, is improved in their health by eating something that they don't eat naturally in the wild. You know, in fact, any zookeeper will tell you that if you feed an animal something that it doesn't eat in the wild, something it didn't evolve on, it gets very sick. But what does it get sick with? It gets obesity, heart disease, diabetes, cancer, autoimmune diseases, arthritis, and the rest, all the things that we get. In fact, they call them human diseases. They say, no, 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 don't feed them that crap or else they'll get human diseases. You feed animals human food, they get human diseases. Well, what does that tell you? It tells you the food is causing the disease or they're not catching diabetes from us. They're not catching cancer from us. They're not catching Crohn's disease from us. You eat this food and you get Crohn's. Now you give that to a dog and it gets Crohn's. What, what, are, you, what are you not missing? What are you not getting here? What, what is the connection that you're missing? This is, why, this is why there are signs at parks and at zoos that say don't feed the animals. It makes them sick. They eat this, they get sick. It's everywhere. Any zoo you go to will mostly have these things. I, you know, I, uh, I'm sure there's some that <laughs> don't put them up, but every one that I've been to have these things and most parks have them as well. So there's just tons and tons of these things, um, you know, examples about how if you eat an unnatural diet, something you didn't evolve on, that you, that it causes problems throughout the animal kingdom. And the idea that what we've been eating for millions of years is somehow extreme is I think extreme. That is natural. That is proper. That is biologically appropriate to our species. And just like all animals, when they're eating a biologically appropriate diet, they do better. They live longer. They don't have the health issues that other animals have. 
And so what's extreme is deviating from that. What's extreme is eating hundreds of plants that we've never eaten before, ever. And more to the point, these plants haven't even existed more than a couple hundred years, some of these things. They certainly didn't exist 50,000 years ago, 100,000 years ago, 500,000 years ago, when, we, when our ancestors were turning into Homo sapiens, because that's what we should be eating. If we weren't eating plants back then, then we shouldn't be eating those plants now. So maybe we were eating some plants every now and then. I mean, there weren't too many plants available in the ice ages, right? If you're on an ice shelf, you know, you're crossing, uh, you know, the Bering Sea on the land bridge from Asia to, to North America. I mean, I, you know, what fruits were available then? What vegetables were growing then? What tubers were they getting then? None. And, you know, they, because they were living as the, you know, the Inuit are now, just on, on the meat that they hunted. So that's not extreme. That is how humans have survived and thrived for millions of years. That is the story of humanity, is one of, 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 of thriving on a hunted diet, on a meat-based, nearly meat-exclusive diet in many ages. I mean, what plants are the Inuit eating? Not much. You know, even the Mongols, Genghis Khan, the Mongol horror, they almost exclusively ate meat, drank horse blood, horse meat, and, uh, and fermented mare's milk. And there are plenty of other examples. Uh, throughout history of, of actual civilizations. You know, the Mongol Empire was the largest contiguous empire that's ever existed. And so that's why I always think that there's a bit silly when people say, no, you need agriculture to support cities. I'm like, Genghis didn't, you know? And that was the largest empire we've, that we've ever had apart from the British Empire, but that was, a, that, was a, that was scattered throughout the world. This was just this was one big chunk. And so, and then the Native Americans, they were, uh, they were you know, meat, eating people, you know, eating just buffalo and things like that. Maybe some other things if they were hungry or, or had needed them for uh, medicinal purposes or something like that. But primarily, they just ate fatty meat. They were very healthy. These guys were, were, you know, well upwards of six foot four, six foot five. There's a meeting between some of these guys from the Great Lakes came down to meet uh, Thomas Jefferson when he was president. And Jefferson was about six two, six three, And he describes this encounter as... They were giants. These guys were absolute giants. And, uh, and, and, you know, recreating from different paintings at the time and, and looking at the proportionalities and them next to each other, they estimated these guys were probably pushing seven feet tall. And so these were massive, massive people. And the average height of a population denotes the average health of a population. The average height of these areas that were eating, you know, just mastodons and mammoths and things like that were like six foot two, six foot four. And now in America, the average adult male height is, is five foot eight. And our brains have shrunk. You know, about you know, eight to 10,000 years ago, when the agricultural revolution hit, our cranial capacity has gone down by 11%. That's not genetic. Our brain, our brain sizes were going up, 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 up. You know, parabolically, this was an exponential growth for the last two million. And it was going up pretty rapidly for about, you know, or five, six million years. And then you hit about 2 million years ago and it shoots up. It's the fastest growth in, in cranial capacity that we've ever seen in any species, right? And then you get to the agricultural revolution and it goes up and bam, straight down, right? And so, okay, let's, let's say, you know, we're not on board with that evolutionary chain of events and things like that. Totally fine. All you need to do is look at Homo sapiens for the past you know, several hundred thousand years, tens of thousands of years, you can look 50,000 years ago and see that humans then had much larger brains than Homo sapiens do right now, right? And it was still getting up big, 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 and bang, straight down. So our cranial capacity is 11% smaller now than it was back then. And we're shorter on average than we were back then. We have crooked teeth, we have smaller jaws, we have underdeveloped palates, and we don't get our wisdom teeth in. That's not genetic and that's not normal. It is normal to be healthy. It is normal to have a large, fully formed jaw. And we know from studies in animals, like Pottinger's cats is a very interesting one that people can look into, uh, but they gave them just cooked meat as opposed to raw meat. And they found the ones that gave cooked meat were much less healthy than the ones that got raw meat. And they found generation after generation that the cooked meat ones got worse and worse and worse while the raw meat ones got better and better. And they found that after, you know, in, into the third generation, of cooked meat that they now became sterile. They couldn't actually procreate. Most of them weren't interested in procreation anyway. Their bone mineral density had gone down to like 3%. So they said their bone consistency was like you know, foam rubber. It was just that 
these animals would have dozens of fractures. They couldn't really walk around normally. They were very, very sad sort of things to hear. And, uh, and, they, were, and they were much smaller, they're stunted. There's, their cheekbones and zygomatic arch were underdeveloped. Every generation got worse and their brains were smaller and underdeveloped. Every generation, it got worse. And then they said, okay, we'll give them, them raw meat again. Well, they got healthier. And, and so the ones that were alive were, were doing better. And, but then they were able to procreate and they were able to reproduce and yet they weren't back to normal the next generation. It actually took four generations to get back to the, the, the health that they had started at in the first generation when they started eating cooked meat. So, you know, this has, this has a, a very serious effect. And when we're eating what we're not supposed to eat, even by a small margin, that can have serious effects on our health as individuals, but also has epigenetic knock-on effects generationally afterwards, which is, you know, that's a big deal. And I think most people would be very, very, very interested in not doing that to their kids and making sure that their kids have, you know, the best advantages and at least can live up and develop to their genetic potential. You know, not even get anything special, just realize their own genetic potential, which none of us have done. You know, because none of our parents were carnivores when they uh, conceived us and our mothers weren't carnivore throughout pregnancy and, and um, breastfeeding and we weren't carnivores all through growing up. I mean, you know, there are certain people around the world that have had that that fortune, but I, you know, I'm, I'm not one of them and most people aren't one of them. And, and uh, yeah, so, you know, it's something that has a dramatic effect on on our health and it's something that we absolutely cannot take for granted species appropriate diet as we keep coming mm -hmm. back to isn't it, it yeah. Anthony, i'm um conscious of your time but i've got a couple of other quick questions if you've got time to run through these um mm -hmm. so fiber is one that i get mm -hmm. asked continuously now um there are a, a number of reasons that we are told to consume fiber um one is that it feeds the colonocytes in the gut. It breaks down into a short chain fatty acid called butyrate. Uh, all of that's true. Um, but that butyrate is further broken down into beta hydroxybutyrate, which is a ketone body, which being ketogenic, we produce and feed every colonocyte and not just the ones that that fiber comes in contact to. Um, but also what we're not told is that um, animal proteins also contain uh, short chain fatty acids in the form of isobutyrate, isovalerate, uh, propionate, all of which have been shown to feed the colonocytes at a higher rate than, than short chain fatty acids from, from fiber itself. Um, we're also told that we need it for bowel movement, but all the research actually shows the opposite. The more fiber you put in, the more issues that you have with um, constipation, etc. cetera. Um, is there any reason to put plant fiber into our diet over animal fiber, because I can't see any benefit from fiber from plants uh, that mm -hmm. we cannot get from fiber from, from animals. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't see uh, that. Well, there's no, I mean, there's no nutritional benefit certainly because we don't, we don't derive any nutrition from them. Now, some of, some of the bacteria in our gut can, can break down a, a, a modicum of the fiber, like you say, um, you know, th this thought that th these short chain fatty acids can be good for you. And they are good for you. You know, I don't argue that, but they're not that, that much. You're not going to, you're not going to subsist on them. It's not going to, that's not going to fuel your whole body like it would a gorilla uh, or a chimpanzee or an elephant, because that that's at the end of the day, what they derive their, their energy and their nutrition from, they have guts that are, that are set up to foster bacteria, which actually eat the fiber, no, no vertebrate animal can break down fiber. So this has to come from these, these bacteria that they cultivate in their gut. And it's the bacteria that eat, you know, the fiber. And then as a byproduct, they release these short chain fatty acids, as you mentioned, and these are 100% saturated. We're talking about saturated fat, how bad they are. Well, you know, cows run on saturated fat, gorillas run on saturated fat. Basically, all animals run on saturated fat, you know, like a hummingbird eating, you know, nectar or something like that, you know, maybe not, but, but basically everything else that eating, you know, plants and animals, they do. And so, you know, even a gorilla that just eats green leaves, they get about 70% of their calories from these saturated fats and, and cows get nearly 80%. 
and then the bacteria die off and the cow or the gorilla or, or an elephant absorbs the bacteria as these proteins. So, so even herbivores are absorbing fat and protein. We need fat and protein. All animals, mostly all animals need fat and protein, except again for like the nectar eating ones, you know, and bees and things like that. The rest of us need fat and protein. We can't derive fat and protein from fiber. We do. We have not that ability, and so therefore we need to derive it from something else. Sixty-six percent of animals, as I mentioned before, are carnivores. That's because they can't derive proper fat and new, and protein and other nutrients from plants. It's very difficult to actually change change plant tissue into animal tissue. That's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to build and maintain animal tissue. We're trying to build and maintain meat. So what is going to have the most bioavailable and uh, uh, nutrients and, you know, just, just, you know, all of the uh, essential nutrients that you need to build and grow and maintain meat, meat, right? It's very simple. Just cut to the, cut straight to the chase. And so when you're talking about fiber, I think it's, it's a bit silly that we're, we're even having this discussion. We're talking about eating something that you cannot break down more than that modicum. And, you know, and we're saying this is an essential nutrient. Essential nutrient is a very specific term. It means that if you do not consume this, you will die, right? So how is fiber an essential nutrient when none of our ancestors have really subsisted on this to any, any great degree? The Native Americans didn't, the Inuits don't, you know, the Maasai don't, I don't. You know, if this is an essential nutrient, I could be long dead. There are so many people that do not eat fiber. You know, most people that even eat a standard diet hate fiber, you know, because it, you know, people naturally understand that it actually doesn't make them feel all that good. It makes them bloated, gives them gas, gives them these large, massive blockages of, of stool because you can't break it down. You can't absorb it. Whereas if you're eating other things, and, and we say this in medicine as well, you know, when you have a colon disturbance or you injury to your colon, like diverticulosis, diverticulitis, um, or appendicitis, you're treating conservatively, or you've had surgery, you say, okay, eat a low residue diet because you need to rest your colon, you need to rest your bowel. Well, what is that? That means a no fiber diet. That means you're eating things that you can absorb, like meat, right? Or, you know, simple carbs or something like that. But you're not eating fiber. Fiber is the only thing that, that that is in that, right? So when you say eat a low residue diet, it's not a low residue diet, it's a low fiber diet. That's the only thing that causes that, that amount of residue because you can't really break it down at all. So the idea that we need to eat something that we can't break down makes no sense. Well, you just have this physical something that we can peristalse and move through. Well, that idea came at about 1986 because, you know, people were, once they stopped eating a bunch of fat after 1977 USDA declaration that fat and cholesterol cause heart disease, people stopped eating fat. Everyone got constipated because it's actually fat that drives your digestion. They were just like, oh my God, everyone's constipated. Everyone's gaining weight. What do we do? Eat fiber. It was a cure-all for everything because, well, it'll, it'll give your body something to work on and push through and peristalse. And also it'll fill you up, make you feel physically full. So your body will say like, oh, we've got food here. Totally fine. Well, you know, the problem is we have more than just stretch receptors to tell our brain if we've got an adequate nutrition. We've got a, a lot of very sensitive uh, nerves that, that and through the vagus nerve that fire up and say, Hey, we've got this much fat coming in, this much protein coming in, this much of whatever coming in. And, uh, if you're not getting that, your body's just like, Hey, what's going on? Where's the beef? Let's do this. You know? And so you stay hungry and now you're bloated and you're eating more and your, your, your stomach is just full of this fiber and you just feel like garbage. And that's one of the number one things that, that people tell me when they start a carnivore diet, they're like, I, my bloating went away instantly. You know, I, maybe it's just placebo, but it's been two days. I have no bloating. I feel amazing. It's, it's not placebo. You stop eating the things that cause bloating, which is what fiber does. You know, so what are they basing this on? What are they, they as you say, I mean, the whole idea with the, the short chain fatty acids is it's nonsensical because we get we get these from other sources. It's not like that's, that's the only place that that comes from. That's uh, you know, that's just ignorant of the facts. So the the evidence for this, the so-called evidence for this, is is just nonsensical associative epidemiological study. Oh, these people that kind of eat more fiber, they seem to have kind of more better outcomes. Like, okay, you know, that's the only thing you changed. So this is, this is a controlled experiment. You added in fiber or took away fiber 
and you saw it different? No, that's not what it is. You know, this, these just the surveys that they ask people, like how much of this do you eat and that do you eat? Well, what, what are people doing when they're eating fiber? No one likes fiber. No one enjoys that. No one enjoys chewing on tough, woody nonsense. Most kids avoid it. You know, you give, you give a kid, you know, a sandwich with, you know, Wonder Bread or with, you know, whole wheat bread. I, I know what I would have chosen as a kid. And, you know, because it's, it's just more palatable. It's easier to chew. And so the people that are going out of their way to get a high fiber diet, they're probably focusing on whole foods and they're probably more health conscious and healthy user bias. And so, you know, that's not a, that's not a high level of evidence. There's a lot of confounding factors that go into that. And so when the only actual interventional trial that we know of uh, that exists on fiber was a smaller study. It was like sort of 60, 70 patients and they all had, you know, sort of GI upset. They all had like, you know, bloating and, you know, painful guts and painful stools and constipation, all these sorts of things. And so they had to be symptomatic and they all ate, you know, whatever they ate and they put them up into four groups. You know, one of them just stayed, just keep eating what you're eating. One, increase the amount of fiber that you're eating. One, reduce the amount of fiber you're eating. The other, completely eliminate fiber. And wouldn't you know, they perfectly stratified into those four groups their symptoms were better or worse directly related to the amount of fiber that they had. So the people that increased the amount of fiber, they all got worse. People that ate the same, they stayed the same. Reduced fiber got better. Eliminated fiber, they got that entire group completely eliminated their symptoms yeah. of GI. You know, so that's the only actual experiment that we have at all. You know, the rest of it is just this associative uh, sort of stuff with a lot of confounding factors. Now there, there are epidemiological studies that that can that can give good information if they're done properly. These aren't them, and and they don't trump actual interventional trials. Which you know, even even the smaller nature of this, you know, is better evidence than you know that epidemiological studies with it with a ton of confounding factors and things like that. And if people don't believe that, fine, do a bigger study with hundreds of patients, thousands of patients, right? But do an intervention, do an actual study to see, do a clinical trial that can see what's going on here. Because the only one we have now is showing that it doesn't help. And then you have now hundreds of thousands of people around the world switching to a carnivore diet, and they are all finding benefit. They are all finding their bowels improve. That's one of the main ones that I see. And IBD, um, you know, IBS, these things just go away when you go on a carnivore diet. You know, IBD, irritable bowel, or inflammatory bowel disease. Right, so there's like things like Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. People with Crohn's and ulcerative colitis get absolutely torn to pieces when they eat fiber. It destroys their bowels. They're having twenty to thirty bloody diarrhea stools a day because of these sorts of things. But when they stop eating fiber, when they stop eating plants in general, and just go to a high fat meat based diet, it cures them. C U R E S cures them. Right. And they come off medication and they don't have the, these horrible symptoms. There, you know, and, and this is not just anecdotal, you know. I mean, there's plenty of, of anecdotal evidence. I have literally dozens of my own patients that I see in clinic outside of you know, neurosurgery. I have a functional medicine and metabolic health practice. And I see many people with autoimmune issues. It cures them, right? Even on biopsy in a couple of months, they'll see that there's actually no sign of disease. And their gastroenterologist, I've never seen this before. They're off medication, they have no symptoms, and they have nothing on histology. You take that and take it to the lab, nothing, no sign of disease, right? But outside of that, and then thousands, hundreds of thousands of people around the world, they're finding this, especially with things like Crohn's and ulcerative colitis uh, and other autoimmune issues. I literally just walked by someone today in the, in the neighborhood. Uh, my girlfriend and I were going for a walk, and someone recognized me and said, hey, Dr. Chape, I don't, I don't know why people are recognizing me, but like, you know, they just like, oh, I watch your videos, all these sorts of stuff. And like, you know, I have rheumatoid arthritis completely gone. I had it for 17 years. I'm off all medications. I'm, I mean, I feel great now. And, uh, you know, so we see this a lot. Um, a lot of people are doing this around the world. But, but you know, and, and a lot of people, especially the plant-based people, or even, even just, you know, the detractors of one way or the other, 
we'll just say that's anecdotal. That doesn't count. I was like, okay, well, you know, a few hundred thousand people being anecdotes. That's, you know, the plural of anecdote is data. And, you know, there are people, you know, collating these sorts of things and they have, there's a Harvard study, um, you know, that's, that's epidemiological survey based, which is just as, as uh, viable as every other epidemiological survey based nutritional study that any of these guys are trotting out. Um, but they just go, oh my God, that's that's epidemiology. Like you, the only thing you're talking about is epidemiology. Okay, so you know you can't just say, you know, you you won't use one and and not the other. Um, but and if even you don't then, believe it, take it out of your diet, yeah. isn't it? I mean, I know you you come back to these trials, but if you don't believe the benefits, remove mm -hmm. fiber from your diet, uh, and you yeah. will see those health benefits yourself personally. Uh, the the guys that mm -hmm. I've worked with locally. Um, I worked with uh, some people with severe gastrointestinal problems. Once they go carnivore, everything clears up. They've paid to go privately, um, to which they were only given further medication, um, which didn't help. Uh, I sat down with a gentleman uh, just before Christmas last year for two hours, went through his diet. Uh, we eliminated everything. The only way forward for him was to go carnivore. Two weeks later, he walked through my door and said, I haven't had an issue since um mm -hmm. he is now full carnivore he could not leave society basically um for the better part of 10 years and he sent me a picture one day uh, up a mountain um and my instant reaction was oh great i'm glad you're having a good weekend and he messaged back i said no you don't understand i haven't been able to leave civilization in over 10 years because of my issues and i'm i'm up here wow. without a care in the world uh and in um, recognition to that, he did uh, a hundred mile hike, I think, over the Himalayas or something to raise money for charity Jeez. recognition for for curing. Uh, but again, we, we call it a cure, and it's um, it's it's environmental again, isn't it? I mean, if you begin mm. to put these things back in, these problems will come back. Um, mm. So in essence, you know, he's cured until he deviates again. But it um, hopefully he won't. Yeah. Uh, he's well over a year and a half in, and live in his best life uh, and that is the power of diet isn't it that is the power of eating highly nutrient dense foods devoid of these anti-nutrients and things that are causing these um these problems within the body um yeah. so was, fiber, I was, I was say, oh i was just gonna say you, you know you're, yeah to your point like um yeah these these sorts of issues like you say like it's cured or it's in remission but basically what it is is like they you know you don't have lead poisoning anymore. Like, great, you eat lead again, you're going to have lead poisoning. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. it's just that sort of nature. And uh, what I was just going to say um, as well was that, you know, if you don't want to deal with these epidemiological, you know, studies that actually show the opposite of what you're saying or that that invent interventional trial that shows fibers uh, crap and uh, or the anecdotal studies of now tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people around the world, fine. There's actual data in the literature or for gastroenterology showing that putting someone on an elemental diet, which is what steak is, it's just the nutrients and nothing else. But in this, it's uh, trials, it's, it's a very processed, it's just a, you know, just a can of powder that has all the nutrients you need, no ketones. They generally use the, the ones that you are used for uh, putting kids who have epilepsy on in, in keto, because we had a hundred years of evidence showing that a ketogenic diet is very, very helpful in uh, epilepsy, especially pediatric epilepsy. And so when you put people on that elemental diet, just as a nutrients and nothing else, um, and, and often don't have any carbohydrates at all, that this is a better, uh, a better treatment for an acute flare-up of Crohn's disease than prednisolone, right? Steroids, putting someone on steroids, that's, that's the gold standard to get someone out as quick as possible. It causes a lot of damage. It, it really messes up your system. So you can only do it for a short period of time. And then you get on these other, you know, bigger, you know, biologics and things like that, that have a lot of their own problems, but just not eating plants and this other stuff, that's a better treatment for an acute flare-up of Crohn's than steroids. Then the best treatment we have pharmacologically, just not eating that garbage is better than that, right? So that's one study. Another study is shows specifically with fiber and carbs. So they put people on a ketogenic diet, no carbs, but also no fiber, right? Well, what else is there to eat from the plant kingdom that doesn't have fiber, right? You're basically just eating meat, right? So, uh, you know, it doesn't, doesn't necessarily go into what these guys are eating, but they eliminated carbs. 
and they eliminated fiber. Contrasted that, so this is this is a controlled trial. So they had they had patients that that didn't uh, take out carbs and fiber, and they took a look, and they found that the people that eliminated carbs and fiber with Crohn's were able to stay in remission from their Crohn's without medication on average, fifty one months, right? So that's that's over four years without a problem, right? right. Contrast the control group that didn't eliminate carbs and fiber, they stayed in, in remission on average zero months, right? So not, not many months, right? So that's a clear, clear indication that there is something in the carbs and fiber or something that the carbs and fiber come with that cause Crohn's and other things as well, because obviously, you know, there's, there's some of these people aren't staying in remission that whole time. And uh, so there's other things that contribute to stuff as well, but just the carbs and the fiber, were a massive, massive, massive uh, boon to these people to eliminate. Yeah, incredible. It, um, yeah, it's uh, it, it, it's a journey, isn't it? It's, it's that rabbit hole, as you say. And um, and this is why I think some of the, the clients that I work with see benefits from being ketogenic, even living a, a dirty keto lifestyle. Um, but the further they gravitate into a more animal-based lifestyle. So I try to promote, we, we, I look at the eat well plate in the UK, which predominates carbohydrates, limits protein and fat. Um, and I try to tell people to physically fill their plate with predominantly animal proteins. So, you know, 70, 75% of your plate to be animal proteins. If you're going to put veg in, make it a quarter of your plate. Um, ideally, don't put any veg in at all. Um, to which they, they come back, well, where am I getting my vitamins and minerals? Um, so that led me further down this rabbit hole of investigating um, the bioavailability uh, of, of, these, uh, of these nutrients. Um, and plants, let's look at vitamin A, start at the top, retinol. We are told, I was told growing up to eat my carrots for, for retinol. Um, Carrots don't contain any retinol. They contain zero vitamin A. Plants contain something called beta carotene, which is a precursor that needs to be acted upon by an enzyme called BCMO to convert it into retinol. And to do so, it's depleted by 21 times. Whereas meat contains an abundant amount of, uh, of, of, of retinol. B vitamins, all very low in plants. Vitamin B12, cobalamin, non-existent in plants. B1, B2, B3, pyridoxine, vitamin B6, all super low in plants high in animal proteins. Um, what else have we got? Vitamin D doesn't exist in plants. We get that from the sun and we get it from animal proteins. Kale in the UK, when you pick up a pack of kale in the supermarket, it is stamped on there, says high in vitamin K. There is no vitamin K in kale. Kale contains vitamin <laughs> K1 and we need vitamin K2. And again, we need to convert that K1 into K2 and the body does it so inefficiently, close to zero is converted. Um, and then these plants do not contain creatine, choline, carnitine, carnosine, taurine, all of these things which are essential for life we cannot get from plants. Um, and when you break it down, plants, uh, the nutrients they do contain, uh, carry super low bioavailability. Animal proteins carry every vitamin and mineral that we need. And the argument that I, I'll get back, if any, when I go through this, when I show people a, a little chart when I'm doing a consultation of the breakdown of these nutrients is, well, what about vitamin C? Um, there's no vitamin C in, in animal proteins, but there is. Animal proteins, as you know, contain vitamin C. And the interesting thing with vitamin C is that vitamin C and glucose fight for absorption. They, they compete for absorption within the body. They, they fight for the same metabolic pathway. So when we reduce carbohydrates, the body absorbs more vitamin C. So the less carbohydrates we consume, the more vitamin C that the body absorbs from the meat. And we've seen this during the Napoleonic War when the soldiers who were suffering with scurvy were fed dead horse meat, and this was enough to cure their scurvy. So there is nothing in plants that we cannot get from animal proteins. Um, so yeah, I don't know if there's anything you wanted to add to that, but I, what I wanted to go on to quickly there is then it, um, tea and coffee, which are, are the staple of, of every... Um, every person that I know of, uh, whether they live in a ketogenic lifestyle or not, um, now tea is high in catechins and coffee, uh, high in caffeine, but acrylamide, uh, I know you said earlier, I think I caught that you don't drink coffee. Um, mm. yeah, hit me with that. What, what would you recommend to drink? Um, 
you know, as far as teas and coffees, would you recommend we don't touch them at all? Is there a limit to how much we can drink? Are they accumulative? Um, can we drink them now and again? Um, yeah, what are your thoughts? Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, people are welcome to do what they want, but I think that if uh, if you want optimal health and you want to really maximize how you feel, then I, I would avoid them uh, completely. I've noticed that for me, like I said, I don't get sore after I work out. However, I, I put that to the test once because I was like, well, maybe I'm not working out hard enough and pushing myself and ended up doing 32 sets of squats and heavy legs to failure in a four hour period. And I, I didn't actually stop there because I was worn out. It was just that I could, I just realized I could just keep doing this the rest of the night. And something was weird was going on. And I was like, well, I've been here for four hours and I've got shit to do. So I need to go. And then the next day, you know, I went hiking. It wasn't sore. Didn't, didn't have any problem. Uh, went hiking with a friend for hours. I got up a very steep uh, hill, a mountain really. And uh, they went to rugby practice that night because I felt so good. I was like, right, I'm, I'm going back out to play rugby. I just got back from Bangladesh doing humanitarian work. I was 38. I didn't think I was going to be you know, able to get back and playing it. But I was like, I, two weeks into carnivore, I'm like, I feel awesome. Like, I'm going to go do this. And so after that heavy, heavy, crazy leg day the day before and that big hike that morning, I went and had uh, training with the Seattle Seawolves, the, the professional team. Uh, in Seattle, I, I grew up playing with Seattle and I, they converted into the Seawolves. And I was there at, at a dead sprint doing everything everyone else was that had been training the whole time I'd been away in the refugee camps. And so, you know, the next day I still wasn't sore. The day after that, it should be two days after, that's usually when at the peak of your soreness still wasn't sore. Went and got a cup of coffee with a friend and said, okay, let's see, let's check coffee. Let's see, because I would, I would test these things and see what, how it would affect me. I was like, okay, I'll try coffee and see what that does. You know, let's see if I can have coffee. I had one cup of black coffee and within 20 minutes, I could feel myself getting sore and stiff and my hamstrings were tightening up. My back was getting painful. I was like, what is happening? And I no, realized what was happening was these were the inflammatory mark, uh, factors in coffee that were causing this pain, this pain and soreness. And I was sore for the next two days because of this. For me, I was like, okay, no, I'm, I'm never touching that stuff. And, uh, you know, tea as well, they have a lot of tannins and other sorts of anti-nutrients and yeah. just the caffeine itself can strip your body of magnesium and they also dehydrate you. So it's a perfect, perfect storm for cramps. And, and a lot of people when they go on carnivore, like, oh, I'm getting these bad leg cramps and foot cramps at night. You know, I need to take all these different, uh, you know, electrolytes and things like that. I'm like, well, maybe, but you know, if you're taking all these electrolytes and you're still getting all the, all the cramps, well, then it's not the electrolytes, there's something else going on. And uh, quite often it's, they're dehydrated or maybe they're drinking coffee and they're getting dehydrated and they're losing magnesium, which is going to double up their, their problems with, um, with uh, uh, cramping. Um, it was a couple of interesting things. You're talking about bioavailability, that story with Napoleon. Um, I actually learned that, you know, Bovril, you know, that, that little can of black paste, you know, it just looks like tar, you know, sort of like, you know, it's like in a, in a camp with like Marmite and, and Vegemite and there's Bovril. And it's a very unappealing name, but that was uh, originally uh, procured for Napoleon in the Napoleonic Wars because he's, he sent someone, I forget the guy's name, but he said, okay, you need to figure out when I can get, I can feed all my troops something that pure nutrition that can travel. As the guy went down to Argentina and thought about it and say, okay, we're just going to take all these cattle and we're just going to boil them down. And they just like took all these cows and just boil them down, boil them down. So that tar is just essence of cow. Oh. And, and they ship these things off. And they, that was it. It's just cans of bomber. And that's what the, and that's what the troops ate. And that's what the troops ate. And it, and it fueled these Napoleonic wars, these, these massive world wars uh, across the world. And that's what it was. It was just, it was just essence of beef. And um, the bioavailability of plants is another way that they defend themselves from predation. Because if, they are just these bags of nutrition that obviously that's going to benefit the plant, the animal to eat you. And they don't want that. They want, they want to sequester their nutrients. So they bind different nutrients and vitamins and minerals up in ways that, that you can't access them. So if you're not designed to eat them, you know this by the fact you can't get nutrients out of them. So there are a lot of these things like, you know, like iron in, in uh, spinach and things like that, you know, like, yes, there's iron in there, but it's very uh, hard for us to get. And, and a lot of this stuff is sequestered in ways that we, we can't actually break down, we can't actually uh, uh, you know, obtain. Uh, and many, many nutrients are like that. 
A great example of this is niacin in corn. There's a there was famous, famous, basically plagues of niacin deficiency. Didn't know it was niacin deficiency. I thought it was an actual infectious disease called pellagra. And this happened after uh, Europeans went to Mesoamerica, noticed that people were growing maize, which is corn, and they took that over. Actually, you know, it is maize. Corn was just a name for a kernel or a seed or whatever. And they were like, so that was a general term. And they were just like, oh, it's just the, the corns. So it's the corn kernels or whatever. That's it. They ended up just getting that general name. Um, it was something that was very easy to grow. Basically everywhere is it was very, you know, uh, resistant. Um, and so they grew a lot of it. And this was cheap. And so a lot of people who were very poor, you relied on this stuff and they were poor, so they couldn't afford much else. And so they're eating predominantly corn. They weren't really able to get meat and they were dying of pellagra. And they thought it was an infectious disease. This was killing, you know, millions of people across Europe and America. And they tried to hit this commission and put this guy in charge and say, hey, you know, figure out what it is. And he said, look, I don't think this is an infectious disease. He wasn't an, an infectious disease expert. And he said, I don't think this is an infectious disease. I don't know what's going on, but I think it has something to do with corn. And he looked into it and he found that it was actually uh, from this niacin deficiency. He figured it out. And the, the crazy thing is, so this is a niacin deficiency. Pellagra is, is a niacin deficiency and, it, and it's life-threatening. It can be fatal. The, the irony of that is that corn actually has a lot of niacin in it, right? So if you're eating it with meat and you're doing other sorts of things, you know, you, you're not going to really have a problem. But the not the but you, you shouldn't really have a problem anyway because there's niacin in there, right? So why, why are you having a niacin deficiency? Well, it's because the niacin is bound up in ways that we cannot access. And that's not, that's not you know, an abnormal thing. That's most nutrients that, and proteins as well that are available in plants. They're just foreign to us. And we, we don't have the capabilities and machineries and the mechanism to break these things down. So that's why we have to go through these chemical processes. That's why we boil beans and lectins. That's why we have to process cassava. That's why we have to go through a process called niche tamalization with corn, which is where the word tamale gets its name from, to basically break down a lot of the different toxins that are in it and then free up and break those chemical bonds that are binding up the niacin and other nutrients and make them bioavailable to us. So people in Mesoamerica were able to survive on this as part of their, of their diet because they were able to get extract many, many more nutrients out of it, including the niacin. And so, you know, that just goes to show you that we are not designed to eat these things, right? We, if you have to put something through an industrial process, then obviously you don't have the machinery and bio, biomechanics to do it yourself, to either detoxify it or to make it bioavailable. That means by definition, you are not designed to eat it, right? We are designed to eat meat. We get everything we need from meat in the proportion that we need it. So the, you know, we call it like an egg yolk, a perfect protein. That's because it has every single protein that we need in the exact ratios that we need it, right? That's important. It's not, you're not just getting, you know, they say like, oh, well, you know, you know, I mean that you can get a complete protein from plants. It's, it's much more difficult. It's not as bioavailable. You come with a bunch of plant toxins, plant toxins and other sorts of things as well, but they're also out of, out of balance, you know, as a, as a, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, expert in animal nutrition, uh, Dr. Peter Ballerstedt said, you know, because animal nutrition is much better field of science and applied science than human nutrition. Human nutrition sucks. Like it's a terrible science. And it's also vastly corrupted. Um, you, people can go into looking at that and look at the origins of, of nutritional sciences. It was started by the Seventh-day Adventist church who are religiously anti-meat. And they thought that meat was simple because people became more you know, productive. They, they wanted to have sex more. They wanted to procreate more when they ate more meat. They're like, oh, meat makes you lustful. Lust is a sin, therefore meat is evil. That, literally, that's what these people thought. And they still somehow think this, uh, even though that's clearly just making you more healthy and making you, you biologically ready to procreate. And your body's saying, hey, your hormones are working. Everything's great. You have enough resources. Go make kids, right? That's what we're designed to do. They think that's sinful. So this is what, this is what they thought. And they started the field of nutritional sciences back in, I think, 1917. And they've been heavily influencing this the entire time. So this is why plant-based uh, nutrition is such a big thing. It has always been such a big thing uh, in, in the nutritional sciences. But in, in, in animal nutrition, 
it's extraordinarily robust because you can actually take thousands of head of sheep that are biologically similar or cows or whatever, and you can change one thing. You can actually have an interventional trial. And you say, okay, we're going to change this one thing. Let's see what it does. And it's better or worse. Okay, well, that's actually good information, right? You can't do that with people. You can't take people and sequester them throughout their entire life cycle and, and perfectly match the conditions and, and influences that they have and, uh, and, and think that that's, you know, and do that with thousands and thousands and thousands of people over the course of 80 years or 100 years or 120 years which is what we're genetically designed to live, actually. that's I, I learned that in, in my genetics class, that genetically we're designed to live 120 years. So you know, dying in our 60s, 70s, or even at 100, you're dying prematurely. Something is taking your life prematurely, and you should think about that. You know, And you should think about what, what you're doing to, to limit your life expectancy like that. And 100 is a limited life expectancy. We should be making it to 120 on average, you know? If you don't met, if you just don't do anything special and just don't mess up, you should make it to 120, right? So, you know, getting these these nutrients out of plants is very difficult. Like I said, it's it's very difficult to turn plant tissue into animal tissue. And if you if you don't have the biomechanics to get these things out or to detoxify these things without chemical processes, then clearly we weren't doing this naturally 100,000 years ago or 50,000 years ago, right? So it doesn't make sense for us to eat it now. And, and yes, maybe you can use these things in, in times of, uh, of stress or in times of you know, famine. That's, that, that absolutely would have given us a survival advantage. You know, People that could survive on more than others or probably the ones that, that survive now, certainly people in, in agricultural communities and things like that. And that's why people of European descent get all these different heart disease and so forth, but they don't get it as much as Native Americans who are eating a Western diet, Native Australians who are eating a Western diet, Sub-Saharan Africans who are eating a Western diet. These people have a much higher prevalence of these so-called common diseases, these so-called human diseases when eating human food. They used to call it Western diseases, right? Because when, when Western countries and, and Western civilizations would go uh, to these, you know, Sub-Saharan Africa or uh, Australia or uh, North America, South America, they found these people weren't getting these diseases that they just found to be normal and typical in their societies. And so they started calling them Western diseases. Oh, only Western people get these Western diseases. Well, when you know, the non-Westerners started eating the Western food, they started getting the Western diseases as well. And when animals eat, when zoo animals eat human food, they get human diseases. When dogs and cats eat human food, they get human diseases. We need to realize that these diseases, again, are not diseases. This is a direct result of eating the wrong thing. And I think that the majority of the so-called chronic diseases that we're treating nowadays are not diseases at all per se, but they're toxicities and malnutrition. A toxic buildup of a species inappropriate diet and a lack of species specific nutrition, namely too many plants that we are not designed to detoxify and extract nutrients from properly and a lack of, of meat basically that, that has everything that we need. And, you know, and, li and like you say, you know, plants and, and fungi just simply don't have certain essential nutrients that you have to have or you will die. They don't have any B12, D3, K2, like you mentioned. They're not going to have enough vitamin A because you'd have to eat six pounds of, of carrots a day to get enough uh, beta carotene to make enough retinol every day. Good luck doing that. Um, you're not going to get all the essential fatty acids as well. The, the saturated fats, the DHA, EPA, 70% of the solid uh, components of your brain is fat. And 20% of that fat is DHA, EPA, right? That does not exist in plants. We don't really make it very well ourselves. You have to get that from the food that you're eating. Um, and even carnitine, you were saying, I mean, this is this is considered a, a quote unquote non-essential amino acid. However, when people eat more carnitine, their brains develop better, their bodies develop better. They're, you know, in men, their testosterone receptors increase, right? So the, you can have the same level of testosterone, but if you have double the receptors, you're gonna get double the response and or thereabouts. And in fact, they found that in, in vegans and vegetarians, 
their rates of autism are actually much higher. And that's due to many things, I believe. But one of them is a carnitine deficiency because they say that it's a, 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 a non-essential amino acid. However, only 70 people, 70% of people actually make enough carnitine. So it's about 30% of people are deficient in the amount of carnitine that they make. And some don't even make any at all. 30%, that's actually a huge number. And it used to not really show up as a problem in our population because everyone was eating meat if they could afford it. And this is why for thousands of years, you know, the wealthy who could afford meat all the time, they were, they were known to be much more healthy than like the peasant surf class and things like that, that, that just didn't have the same access to meat. I think that's, a, you know, obviously they weren't working in coal mines without a mask either, but like, you know, I think that that, that food made a big difference as well. And, um, you know, so, Jesus Christ, I lost the train of my thought. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh, can you remind me just, just what I was talking about right before the, the, yeah, the... So, I mean, I think it comes back to basically this, this species appropriate diet, isn't it? I mean, everything comes back to that. These, these toxic chemicals that we're putting in from, from plants are causing these, these issues. And as you, as you say, carnitine deficiency, um, oh, that's right. That, that's where you were touching base, isn't it? The, yeah, the carnitine. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so the main thing with carnitine deficiency is is with uh, with autism, is that carnitine is vital for uh, neuronal development, and so it has to do with with the normal workings and mechanisms of your mitochondria, which are being recognized more and more and more as extremely important for our overall health, even for like schizophrenia and major depression and uh, cancer and so many other diseases th these are these come from a dysfunction in our mitochondria and actually putting people on like a ketogenic carnivore diet and fixing their metabolic health fixing their mitochondria has actually been shown to to fix schizophrenia right and it actually helps autism as well and it helps uh adhd and things like that so we're finding that that vegans and vegetarians actually have higher rates of children with autism and there was there was a, a causative study uh, done out of uh, Texas A and M that actually showed that with if you have a if you have a carnitine deficiency, your brain won't develop properly, your neurons won't develop properly, and and you will develop this this form of autism, right? And so, you know, because we normally wouldn't see that in the population because normally everyone was trying to get enough meat and you ate plants because you couldn't get enough meat or maybe you did because you enjoyed it or whatever, but everyone focused on meat. Almost everyone tried to get meat. And so you didn't see this as much, right? Now, you know, those people that have the, that 30% of people that don't make enough carnitine or don't make any carnitine, you know, now we're starting to see those because, you know, people that are, are vegetarian, uh, they're, they're limiting the amount of meat that they're feeding their themselves or their kids. And, uh, and so that they may not be able to get enough carnitine. Most animal source, you know, proteins and things like that will have carnitine in it, you know, dairy and meat and eggs and things like that. But there are a ton of it in red meat. That's the most abundant source of carnitine is red meat. And so what's the first thing that, that vegetarians do when they're cutting out meat? They cut out red meat, right? Because they think that's the worst, right? Well, actually it's the best. And so if their kid is very, you know, uh, deficient in their, in their ability to make carnitine, then they're not going to get enough from just milk and, and some, some, uh, you know, chicken and fish and things like that. They need the red meat. And then vegans, you know, who don't uh, eat any animal products at all, any animal protein at all, even if their kid is slightly deficient in making uh, carnitine, they're not getting any from their diet. And so they'll develop this form of autism as well. So it's not, it's not a small thing, you know, this whole, whole idea of bioavailability or, you know, the, the nutrient uh, density and nutrient, uh, you know, you know, nutrients that exist in plants, it's, it's, it's not a small thing. It is a major, major, major thing. And in fact, you know, vegans and vegetarians have higher rates of miscarriage. Um, there have been a number of, of, you know, because people are getting more and more into this whole plant-based thing around the world, you see, you see more and more stories of people getting their kids taken away from them from, from child protective services because they're, they're, they're just withering away and they're you know, on the verge of, of dying from malnutrition or kids who do die from malnutrition. There are even a number of cases that I've seen of women, of vegan women who are breastfeeding, whose children have died from their breast milk because the breast milk was so deficient in, in proper nutrients that the, that the child dies. Very tragic, tragic stuff. 
And so, I mean, I, I can't imagine that anyone, you know, with children who wants to have children wouldn't think about that and be like, well, I don't want anything like that to happen to my kid, even if it's like, well, well, maybe I can do it just as good. I mean, why would you, why would you take that risk? I mean, even if, even if this was, you know, uh, they just wouldn't get quite as good nutrition and they'll get some of these defense chemicals that slightly hold them back. You know, why, why would you want that at all? Why wouldn't you want the absolute best thing you could do for your child? And the fact of the matter is, is that our brains have reduced by 11% in the last 10,000 years. So, you know, that's, and that's when people were eating still mostly meat, but just including the plants and things like that. And now you're saying, well, you know, I can, I, it's good enough on a vegetarian diet with supplements. No, it, it really isn't. And, you know, maybe your kid grows up and, and looks and acts normal you know, for today's standard of normal, but that doesn't mean that they have developed to their genetic potential. That doesn't mean that they would be as good as they, as they could have been if you just gave them proper nutrition and didn't poison them with these, these plants. And that's exactly what they are, isn't it? They are plant toxins. They are poisons. Um, a few members of um, my family or people closely related are vegan or vegetarian and um despite a few healthy debates um i'm unable to sway them and it's a shame mm -hmm. because the evidence is overwhelming uh you know there, there are a number of reasons as to why someone may decide to live a vegan or vegetarian lifestyle but they they all fall short when they put forward their argument even if it comes to environmental um you know mm -hmm. impacts uh, and again this is something we can touch base on at another time you know but it, um, Anthony, I've taken up way too much of your time. Um, what was meant to be uh, an hour, I think we've done nearly two or over two. But it, um, I think this, I, I could talk to you about this all day. I think this, um, I, I love speaking about health, nutrition, and well being. And I'm looking forward to hearing you uh, speak in person at the Public Health Collaboration, um, which is looking on my other screen now. So I'm attending, I'll be there. So I'll see you there. Uh, but awesome. that is on the 19th and 20th of May. Um, so if you would like to come and listen to, to Dr. Anthony Chaffee speak about uh, what, what is it you're, you're, you're speaking about again? I think you're on a panel uh, arguing yeah. or debating, let's say, not, not, yeah, we won't use the term argue, debating the, um, uh, the health uh, properties of, a, of an animal-based diet over, over vegan and vegetarian, I'm guessing, Anthony, is that right? Yeah, so there'd be a panel of four of us, and, and we're just going to be talking about a lot of the things we're, we're speaking about tonight, and just arguing, you know, on on the merits and demerits of, of eating plants, and do you need to include them? Do you have to have them, or do you even want them in your diet? So there'll be a number of us um, on that, and on both sides of the argument. So it's going to be myself and Dr. Sean Baker, uh, obviously arguing for you know a, a meat based diet. And, uh, and there'll be two other gentlemen on the other side of the debate, one who's, who's you know, promotes a, you know, very strongly a, a plant-based uh, or a plant exclusion, uh, uh, exclusive diet. Uh, and then and someone else who's sort of in the middle, but, you know, thinks that, that uh, plants are probably a good idea. Interesting. Can't wait to listen to that. And I'll be, um, yeah, I'll be there with uh, <laughs> sitting in the audience ready to throw my, my two pen at him. But it's yeah. been great chatting. Thanks again for, for coming on board. Um, I think the takeaway for me on this, again, is, is just reinforce the fact that we need to live, uh, you know, a, a species appropriate diet, a, a diet that we have evolved on our entire existence. And this, for me, is, is predominantly animal based, if not solely animal based. Yeah. And um, for dis full disclosure as well, this isn't coffee. This is... Um, <laughs> So I've, um, yeah, yeah I've uh, taken some ketones to come on today. Uh, not something I use every day, but I, I do use them occasionally. Um, so no coffee for me today as well, but uh, I thought I'd have to get, <laughs> get that in there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but Anthony, fantastic chatting. Thanks again for coming on board. Uh, with a bit of luck, maybe we can get you on again sometime in the future and, and rip apart some other things yeah. that, uh, that, uh, that I wanted to go through. But um, brilliant. Thanks again. Yeah. And I look forward to seeing you in the PHC. Oh, Anthony, before you go really quickly, actually, um, where can people find you uh, on your socials, etc.? Obviously, I know that you're active on social media. I know you're not a lover of social media, but you are active yeah. and promoting on there. Uh, where can 
the listeners find you if they uh, want to find more information? Yeah. Well, and then thank you very much for having me on. It was an absolute pleasure. And it was, it was great talking to you. And uh, I, I mean, I learned a lot from that as well. You know, there's a lot of those interactions and, and specific chemical uh, uh, you know, uh, interactions that, you know, I didn't even know about. So that was great. Um, yeah, I, my my socials uh, are, are generally be found by Anthony Chafee MD. So my Instagram is just Anthony Chafee MD. My uh, YouTube is just YouTube channel is just Anthony Chafee MD as well. And uh, my podcast is just called The Plant Free MD. And I just talk about uh, basically a lot of the stuff that we talk about here and have interviews with other experts and doctors and researchers from around the world that I think add to that conversation. And so if people want to check it out, they, they're they welcome to. Fantastic. And I will pop all of those links below so all of the subscribers and followers can uh, can link up to and subscribe to and follow you there. Anthony, great chatting. Thanks again for coming on board and look forward to seeing you soon. Yeah, thanks, man. You too. And look forward to seeing you in England.